For those of you who are new to the program and who have not been here before, I just want to explain a few things so you'll understand what we're doing here today. Last semester and this semester, uh, the interns in the Asian Social Justice Program made history. They became the first student interns in the United States who volunteered to become part of an internship program to study about the issue of the comfort women and the situation that took place to the people living in Korea during World War II. And they also became the very first people, and I mean the very first people, who were able to interview these women. Now, had you been here last week, you would have seen a similar group of people, similar group of students here, interviewing elderly men and women who were Holocaust survivors. We have a large number of Holocaust survivors living in Queens, an even larger group throughout New York City. So we are able to have our students meet these people, go to their homes, sometimes they come to the college and they have the opportunity to interview them and learn their story and tell their story. We don't have that opportunity when it comes to the issue of the comfort women in Korea, but through technology, which is amazing and changes every day, we have a situation where they are able to interview these women who are in Korea via a video hookup. And two weeks ago, uh, I was at the case office where these interns were sitting down in front of a video screen, looking into the screen and seeing uh, comfort women residing in the house of sharing in Korea, and they were interviewing them, and the women were answering back. I, I have to say that for the part of the time I stood there, I saw some of our students really shaken by the stories they have heard and the reaction to the women. I'd like to introduce one of the people who is very, very much responsible for helping us put this program together, uh, the president of case, Dong Chong Kim. Would you like to come up? Please? Thank you, everyone. Um, it is small step, but uh, it will make uh, the great progress for human rights in the world. I believe you guys are real to me. And and uh, the internship of May among Korean community, Holocaust, Holocaust <coughs> Center, and Prince Border Community College to cooperate and uh, progress for the human rights issues. <clears throat> Northeast Asian has as long history, as long as the European history. But I, th I think you guys didn't uh, learn that much about the uh, Eastern Asian history. And there, the Eastern Asian peoples, they made great value the history. But they may trace their history too. Uh, and we, now we are studying about the human rights issues about uh, modern, in modern history. The Holocaust uh, human rights issues occurred in Europe and comfort women issues in Eastern Asia. The same time, different places, but it is the same issues. So uh, we're going to make a, a good progress, uh, both of the histories uh, the same, and then you're going to we're going to make a good uh, synergy to approach the uh, peoples and uh, progress the human rights issues in the world. And I like to thank you guys, and uh, I like to appreciate uh, Dr. Fru and. Uh, Dr. Jimmy Kim. Thank you. 
I'd also like to recognize another person who has been of great assistance to us, Dr. Esther Lee. Uh, always been there with us. Now, as successful as this internship was, and we've adopted the understanding that we've made a commitment to these comfort women in Korea, that we're not going to forget you, that we're going to remember your story and see that it is not forgotten. Now, it's very easy to say that, but we were most fortunate <coughs> in having someone come on board at the Cup for Burke Holocaust Center and work with us in putting together this program and guiding it through. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Jim and Kim of Columbia University, who's director of the Asian Social Justice Program. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Fluke. Uh, First, I'd like to say that I'm very honored to be part of this program. It has been a very priceless experience for me. And um, uh, I'd like to thank all the people who made this program possible. First and foremost, I'd like to thank all the comfort women who participated in the interview. Uh, we understand that it, has been, it can be very hard for them to record their memories from the past while their human rights were violated and uh, to tell the story over and over again. But they, were, they understood our um, purpose of the program and, and were very courageous and brave to come forward and to share their stories with us. Uh, so I thank them. And secondly, I like to thank everyone, um, Kofferberg Holocaust Center members, uh, staff members, and case staff members. And uh, at last but not, the, not least, I'd like to thank all the student interns of the program. They were very uh, passionate and enthusiastic of the subject. They had very um, different backgrounds and um, different interests and majors, but they gathered here for one common interest in human rights. So they were already smart students, but after 12 weeks of intense discussions on war crime issues and uh, human rights issues, uh, they were more than ready to conduct interviews with uh, war crime survivors. So last week, uh, with the help of translator Mr. Uh, Chewon No of um, <laughs> CASE, uh, we could conduct an interview via Skype with comfort women in Korea at the House of Sharing in Korea. So I will show you a short video clip of the interview first. Okay. 가니까 먼 다크 다리 끌을 위장 그 다리 끌 건너 가는데 아이 옆에서 어이 어이 저 토마토 저 토마토 할게 그래 깜짝 놀래가지고 왜 저기 저 토마토 하니까 저 일본 사람 같아 돌아봐 정말 일본 사람입니다 딱두 사람입니다 근데 해는 다들 가서 사람 중에 해 다져서 사람 없었습니다 그래가지고 그것도 그런데 아이 저 토마토 하던 게 그래서 우리가 아유 어쩌겠는가 저 사람 못 들어가면 우리를 어쩌겠는가 그래 그게 나서 울고 있었어요 울고 있는데 그 일본 사람이 쭉 어디만 우리 둘이 손을 둘이가 붙들면서 가자고 내 딸을 가야지 너네 울, 울, 여기서 울어도 아야 되고 울어도 아야 되니까 그저 아무 소리도 말고 따로 오라 합니다 그러다 보니까 그 저때 가까운 데뭐 일본 사람이 아닙니까 하나는 군주고 하나는 그런 예, 예, 저, 그, 그것, 칼 찬, 그, 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 딱 지, 어찌면 집 같다고, 어찌면 자동차 같다고, 그러기도. 그래가지고 깜짝 놀래서, 놀래서 주의, 어찌, 하니까. 그 다음에는, 그게 어느 곳이. They're crossing the bridge, and this, these, um, this guy was calling out to them, wait, 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 why don't you stay there? 
and they turned around and they saw two um two men and they were Japanese and and she said oh no what are we gonna do and they just like they stayed there they're just like oh no they panicked and they came and then um she turned and as they got closer she noticed that one had a sword on him and one was a soldier and one was uh one was just a Japanese person and they grabbed they grabbed their hands and then took them across the bridge and they said you don't say a word just follow us and um, they went up the mountain and then she saw something dark she wasn't sure if it was a house or if it was a car あ、さらに、ゆうて、ゆうはんくじがにゆうて、りょすんびょいと、ふとりげんだ。ねが、くさらん、いぶんさらん、あ、おらがそなんさらんのじゃ、あん、とかあんじんか、いぶんよじゃ
she was she kept repeating herself saying that it was shameful and, and she didn't she never told her family or anything. She didn't give too many specific details, but I remember her she she remembered everything very clearly, but she didn't want to say. Shu, what about you? What do you remember the most? Yeah, like uh, I was shocked at the beginning because after she knew uh, I'm Chinese and she spoke to me in Chinese, she has been you now for uh, like over 50, 60 years. She was kidnapped to China when she was 15 and then after the war end, she was lost in China because she just couldn't go back to Korea and then she at that time she didn't speak Chinese and then she has had to beg for food on the street and then I just couldn't make that and she said the most say like, like she said like she was not afraid of death but people might forget her story and the truth. Thank you. Could I ask can I ask you a question? I was there the night you were interviewing her. Could you, could you tell us what what was the most startling thing, the one thing that if I ask you to write down one thing that you remembered, what would you say? Um, towards the end of end of the interview, I asked her what she uh, what she felt when she heard the war was over, and she told me she knew nothing of the actual fighting. But she also said that the war isn't over. She said that she wanted us. She said that she's never going to stop fighting for an apology. That's what she said, and I found that sort of startling, but not really. That's all she wants. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I will invite the next group, uh, Pedro Mendoza and Usap Jiri. Could you come out to the front? <coughs> Pedro and Usap interviewed with uh, Mrs. Oxon Park. Uh, Pedro, what? Uh, how was the interview and what was the most important thing from the interview to you? Well, unfortunately we couldn't like interview her completely well because she had Alzheimer's so we couldn't finish to completely f full interview. But I remember that she said that uh, one of her neighbors told her to join, join him to look to get water. Um, by the time he get, she get by the bridge one, one of the guys tell, tell her that stop there and she knew that she was like in trouble and she thinks to jump off the bridge but she knows that the current water is strong and she might die so she just stood there and there is when she, she were kidnapped. She was 15 years old and they took her to a, to a big house. Then she couldn't tell who really was the guys that were inside the, the house and then she, when she arrived to the facility, she knew that she was a comfort woman. Yes, thank you. Um, Usa, could you? Sorry, uh, what do you remember the most from the interview and what was your impression? <coughs> from the interview, the, the, the most important thing to me was when she said that we, this, uh, we, we came to see her and we came to talk to her and she was very happy that our generation was so enthusiastic about the problems that they went through and that she wanted us to fight for what was right and she wanted us to fight for them even, uh, even though they might not be able to continue for very long. They wanted us to fight for their honor and for justice. And I think that to me was the most important part. Yes. Uh, and uh, what has the interview changed your thought or any plan in the future, it, if there is anything? Um, at the beginning, I wasn't really familiar with the topic. Uh, I thought that was the, uh, mm -hmm. the same as the, the concentration camp in Germany. But it really changed me how these people treat these women. It already started 
sharing this information with my family, they were really amazed while all this happened to these women in Korea. And they, they, they actually want to get more information about it. Usa, do you have uh, Is there anything <laughs> that the interview changed your thoughts or actions, or your plan in the future? Um, this whole experience and the interview to me was a very big deal because these were people and they've been through some uh, uh, very incredible, incredible things. Not good, incredible things, bad, incredible things, but things that I had never seen happen and things that I had never known as a kid nor as a teen. Um, so before this semester, if somebody had asked me, you know, the, the, uh, when, when the lady asked us to fight for her honor and for, for justice, that night I went home and I asked myself, if whether or not I would be able, I, I would be willing to leave the comforts of my home to go out and fight for these women, and before this, this semester, the answer would probably have been a no. But then now the answer is a definite yes. I, the interview changed the way I thought, think about life and about humanity in general. I had so many questions, so many. It was all a mess in my head, but the interview. So it, it answered a lot of questions for me, and now I see life very differently. Now I see people differently. Yes. Thank you, Pedro and Usa. <laughs> Next group is uh, Gregory Rinald and Hapziba Prim Kumar. Gregory and Hapsi uh, interviewed with Mrs. Hinam Yu. Uh, Gregory, could you tell us uh, about your interview with Mrs. Yu? Well, during the interview, Mrs. Yu didn't really want to really speak on what actually occurred. Mainly what she was talking about was before and how shameful it, it was for her. So, but what really got to me is how passionate she was about what her parents, how she felt how could her parents let their only child go and basically sell them to that? How her father just really didn't really look, really like her actually. Okay. So what do you remember the most from your experience throughout the program and the interview? Throughout the whole program, I really didn't know much or, well I didn't know about the comfort women at all. And I just, doing Japanese, their, their whole war, I just thought they just was aiding Germany and what Germany wanted to do. But it seemed like they had their own agenda. They wanted to take over Asia themselves. And their attempt on it, it, it was just amazing how they just completely wanted to impose their own way of life on everybody. So I feel what these women been through was, like, it wasn't, exactly what happened, what the, the real struggle is living after it, having to go on with their life with this in their mind, not being able to talk to anybody about it. I think that was the main struggle that they had. Okay, thank you. Hepsi, could you tell us about the, your interview with Mrs. Yu? Well, I asked her some general questions first, like what was her name and what year she was born and um, she was um, a little hesitant to talk about what happened at the comfort station because she gave testimony last year and she has family in New Jersey and her daughters didn't know about what happened to her at the comfort station or that she was an, um, um, a victim. So she was very like shy and she was avoiding the subject but she's, she connected to me in the fact that we're both women and that she asked me that I can, she told me that I can sympathize with her that about how she feels and how she didn't want to really open up about it that much. Okay. So um, is there any, anything you changed your thoughts or your idea about human rights after this program? Well, Miss Yu told me that um, when she returned to her village, Asan, um, after the war, 
Um, her parents didn't even believe that they, their eyes that she was alive, and they they were surprised and they knew that she was a defiled girl, and she was she felt very ashamed of herself. And it, I take that um, I take that she was very courageous to return to her house, and she's very brave to move on and form her own family and have children, and that her like she wasn't bitter towards men after that and well from her life experience I can say that there are bigger problems than my own in my own life and that I want to help other people like in her similar situation and fight for their rights. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Next group uh, Susan Stewart and Tanuja Anirudh interviewed with Oxon Park. Susan and Tanya, could you come out to the front? <clears throat> Susan, same question. Uh, how was the interview and what was your response? The interview was very well done. It was nice. I found that her voice was strong. She was very strong and she was very passionate. And at the same time, she's angry. And I can understand why she's angry. Her body is failing. She soon will be expired. And she wanted to make sure that somebody would continue the journey. And I felt as I was speaking to her that she passed the torch on, and I took the torch. It reminded me of when I went to Dachau, and I saw the situation. Reading about it and going there, gives you a greater knowledge and understanding of what these people actually went through. So I was very impressed and very pleased with the interview. And as I said, I took the torch and I am going strong for human rights, human values. And I don't think that it was a nice thing that happened to these women. When we look back on the word of God, the Bible, it states that God made the man and the man had no company for him. He named the animals, the plants, but there was nothing for him. And God made the woman and brought her to him so that it'd be a comfort to each other. And I see that the word comfort became distorted with these women. And I termed them a bud that never was able to bloom. They were just ravished and never had the opportunity to be presented to a man to be loved and nurtured the way how God intended it to be. Yes. Tanya, could you tell your, about your experience? Um, when I first started the whole program, I had no idea of what Contra Women was or what life they had, had to go through. But as I went through it, I had like a sense of it. And then when I did actually spoke to her, it made it made like complete understanding to everything that had happened. I understood her actual pain instead of hearing it from other people. I heard her own voice and her test her own testimony, and I was able to like have like a one on one conversation like I would have with anyone else on her, being able for her to tell me everything that had happened, and it was just very shocking that other people could do something to someone just because of their gender or their ethnicity or whatever the case is. And I seriously don't wish this would happen ever again. Mm -hmm. And Susan and Tanya, you guys told me after the interview, you like to see the, the in, your interviewee in Korea in the future. Could you tell us more about it? Yes. So everybody in this room, I have been on the work study abroad in in April of this year, I went to Dachau, I went to Berlin, Germany, I went to Austria. And I stayed at the Schultz. It was a rewarding. I met Utah there. And now that I've finished the internship for Korea, I would like a scholarship to go to Korea. I can't do it by myself, and I need help. So I'm looking around the room, and everybody's here, and those that are uh, what is his name, Case? <laughs> <laughs> and the young lady there? Yeah. 
I'll be in your face in a little while because I need a scholarship. <laughs> and my friend here, we were talking about it, and she said, I'll go too. So we're ready, and I'm looking to go before the fall because I start school in the fall. So I'm Whenever ready. Whenever you guys are ready, we're ready. We're ready. We're ready tomorrow. We're ready to. We're ready. Why do you like to go to Korea? Because you, we just want to be there. Like, I doubt that they probably would even take us seriously right now. Because we, she's probably just like, oh, this is probably just a school thing. But it's not really just a school thing. It really touched the bottom, bottom of everyone's hearts. Yes. And why I want to go there? I want to go where they are. I want to sit with them, hold their hand actually give them that comfort, that loving feeling for them to sail away into glory knowing, yes, I took up the torch. Because that's what I'm all about, human rights. And human rights the right way in which we should be treated. And it's not just here in America, it's globally. Things are happening globally. Right now, there is domestic violence, human trafficking, children, there is so much going on right at this hour. And if we don't pick up the mantle and do something, we could have worse than that. OK. Thank you, Susan and Tanya. The last group uh, is Clarissa Mayo and Fauzia Sani. Clarissa and Fauzia, could you come out to the front? Hi, how are you? Hello, Fa my name is Clarissa. Uh, Fauzia, how was the interview? Uh, you interviewed with Oksan Lee, and how was the interview, and what was your response to the interview? Um, my interview with Oksan Lee was um, incredible. She was um, extremely, extremely passionate about her survival um, during the comfort, um, in the comfort station. One thing that struck me about Oksan Lee was how um, abrupt she was, which, you know, it comes with, uh, you know, uh, her age, but, uh, you know, when we asked her a question, she wouldn't even answer it. She'd revert back to, oh, the Japanese treated me so badly and how horribly and brutal she was treated um, during her um, stay at the uh, Japanese um, internment camp. So um, what struck me about um, Aksan Lee was her passion and how um, hard she had fought and how she was taken in her honesty. Clarissa, could you tell about your experience? So, um, you know, when I was going there, I was like, the first time that I opened the door, I saw, you know, this old lady and she looked very fragile. I, you know, I was a little worried that, you know, we would not be able to open up. But as I started asking her questions and then she began answering us, she began like, it wasn't just like, she didn't saw us just like, oh, this is our student. She saw us like, this is a way I can pass on my story. So she really opened everything. She told us a lot of things about her life, you know, how she was treated when she was captured, all the things that she suffered. And I mean, I, there was a moment when I was about like really cry, but since she was so strong, I saw her that like, she was so strong. She gave me like this feeling that I could be strong too for her. So, um, there was one thing she told us, um, when we asked her well, why this was important to her, what she wanted us to remember, she said, um, so she said, people say that the war is over, but for us it's not over yet. We continue to fight and tell our stories to people because we want the Japanese to accept their responsibility and apologize. I just pray that I'm still alive, but if I don't make it, please oh, tell others my story. So, you know, I really want to keep telling her story, and this, you know, this internship gave me the chance to be part of it. And but I, this won't be the end for me. I'm still trying to tell others as much as I can. So, what do the, your experience in the program and your interview um, lead to? What would what kind of actions or change of thoughts in the future? Um, there's my um, basically one thing that I actually did was to change like the whole um, uh, energy around the comfort woman. I actually termed them as comfort survivors rather than women because woman is very uh, 
it's sort of like um, it's finite and it's um, disappearing. So I think comfort survivor is a better word to give to these women because comfort women still signifies a source of pleasure for the men that uh, the brutal men that you know that they served, that they were enslaved to uh, give you know sex services to. So one thing that I changed was the word um, comfort survivor rather than woman, because they weren't w women at the uh, at sort of the um, disposal of these men. One thing that changed my whole view about this internship was how much I learned about Asian culture, um, the whole um, Japanese Holocaust that was um, endured during the 1942 to 1945, the sweeping energy of the Japanese uh, you know, government. I didn't know how strong it was and sort of like the destruction that Emperor Hirohito and his army did to uh, destroy Asia and you know his sweeping energy. One thing also that I did learn was um, you know, um, the passion that these women had and, you know, um, interviewing these women, it, 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 there's nothing that an interview, there's something that an interview gives you that a textbook can't. And the visceral emotion, the energy, the, the poignant points, the, you know, the crying, the, the words that they use. Ak Sun Lee used the word bitch to describe how the Japanese men took her. She used the word, um, she also used the word slaughterhouse to depict how brutal these encampments were in Japan. So these are the, these are the type of words that were used, Aksan Lee used to describe her ordeal with the Japanese. So I learned that, you know, um, you know um, br brutality happens at any moment in time and, you know, it happens and government and people support them, which is very scary. And, um, you know, I hope to, one thing that I want to do you know, in the near future is to keep her legacy alive. Perhaps I'll do a performance piece or a dance, you know, giving, uh, or, and also um, talking to other people about this um, legacy because Oxenly, as Clarissa stated, wants us or wants us to pass on this torch of survival that she, um, that she endured. Okay. Clarissa? Yeah, um, for me, uh, pretty much I just wanna do as much as I can. Um, when I came out of that door, I, I had you know all this thought of everything, and um, ever since I was a child, I always tell like my parents everything that happens to me, most of it. And um, when she, my mom asked me like how did it go, I started telling her about her story. Then I began telling my fiance. Then I began telling all my friends from you know the class. So as much as I can, I've been telling I don't know maybe like ten people already. Um, that's. That's a little that I can do. I feel that that's not enough, but if that's what she wants us to do, that's, that's as much as I'm gonna do. This changing me a lot. I mean, the way that I thought before this, I never heard about Holocaust in Asia, you know? It, it kind of was weird for me. I was like, I never heard it, and, and it, was, it was hard to, to know that all this government, and they just hide all this from us. So as, up to now, or just now, I find out about this. And I only find out about the Holocaust in Germany. That's the only thing they mention in taste books. Everywhere you see it, that's the only thing they mention. So I would like this you know, to also be mentioned there. And um, um, my fiance is going to be a professor in history, so I told him he better mention it. Because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to be important. We don't want uh, the future generations to forget about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to think of something to say. Let me start off by saying, wow. Uh, I always worry with the class of interns. I always worry that all the information we're going to give them will be just facts. They'll look at it as facts. And even though we have you interview like my Holocaust group interviews Holocaust survivors. Uh, I listened to you and there was an eloquence that I felt very jealous of that I would like to possess because all of you came out of there with the commitment saying this is not just a course I took. This is not just something I did that looks good on my resume and I'm going to get a stipend for it. All of you came out of there with an understanding exactly what took place and a commitment to these women that you're going to do something about it. 
And while I was sitting there, I'm saying, what can we do for you to come back to these women? And one of the things we have decided to do, and you'll be getting notices about this, but on July 11th, which is a little, about a month from now, on July 11th, uh, in cooperation with CASE and the Korean government, we are bringing two of these women to campus. They're flying in from Seoul, Korea. They're going to be here on campus, and they're going to meet with you so you can have a face-to-face, -face, a one-on-one -on -one discussion with them, and then they're going to present a program to the entire campus. So uh, I, I just want to tell you really how proud I am of the work you've done in this internship with Dr. Kim, but also how proud I am of you've taken this cause of the comfort women and given it a notice and a highlight that most people don't know about. And uh, when you spoke about your fiance <laughs> and how you talked to him about it, and you also pointed out one thing. You said you never knew about this because it's really not in the history books. It's something like, let's, you know, let's go on to more important things like that. But as long as there's one victim there, you have to go doing it. And one of the things that we are really struggling with is that as time goes on, there are fewer and fewer of these women available. And there's nothing as powerful as having a person who was there telling this story as opposed to reading it out of a book. The fact that you've met these people and know their story, you've become their spokesman. And I want to thank you for that. We have some very important people who have helped us in this program by giving us the support and recognition we need. Unfortunately, many of them have jobs that require they be in other places. So for example, uh, United States Congresswoman Grace Meng called me last week and said, I know I promised to be here to meet with the interns. However, we are voting on an immigration bill for the entire country, and I can't come up from Washington, D.C., but we do have a representative. And Rabbi Pollock, would you like to come up? Sure. Just Thank you. It's really, it's, it's indeed a pleasure, and it's, it's really my honor to meet all of you, and to see you, and to hear the passion and the intelligence that are coming out of these uh, special group of student interns who conducted these wonderful interviews and who have brought history that was hidden and buried to the light of day. And as, as a member of the Jewish nation, and whose also family suffered during the personal European Holocaust of world Jewry, I totally sympathize with what these women had to go through. So I thank you for your efforts. The Congresswoman extends her personal, personal, both greetings and congratulations, and her deep regret for not being here today. But as Dr. Fluke said, she has big issues to attend to. And her service to the community is why she's in Washington now. But she asked me to give all of you something, a recognition of your hard work and efforts. So I came here today. I have special congressional citations to give you personally and I hope this is just some small way of saying thank you and I know you didn't do it or anything other than the fact because you feel it's an important part of your education and your life and hopefully it'll continue on so much greater things you know I'm sure in the years to come thank you Ralph um, thank you if we'll just wait for a minute okay. have, and we also have um, Assemblyman Ed Bronstein uh, also called me yesterday and said, Arthur, I know I promised you I'd be there, but the governor says we have to stay in Albany today because other bills are coming up. But representing uh, Assemblyman Ed Bronstein, where did he? There you go. Just, just stand up so we could recognize you. And also, I'd like, 
Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to say New York City Councilman Peter Koo also called. He said you may be angry that I'm not there, but you may even be more angry because I'm at the city council voting on taxes today. <laughs> but, but he's not there. But what I'd like you to do is this. And when, and I'm an assembly member, Oh, <laughs> assembly. I'm sorry. Could you come? Yeah, I'd like to say something special about assembly member Ron Kim, because everybody here knows him. Uh, when I met uh, Assemblyman Kim last semester, he told me about his experience that he came, uh, he was in Korea and he visited the House of Sharing and we invited him to come down here and you all know he was a speaker at one of the things and not only that, it was such a great presentation, you can tell him he's on YouTube mm -hmm. because we put that on and you will see the same presentations you're doing today will also be on YouTube, but also Assemblyman Ron Kim, tremendous support that he's given to us. I'd like to ask you to come up because nothing's really official unless we take a picture. So I want you to come up and I would like to invite uh, Mr. Don Chun Kim. Yeah, yeah, students, yeah. I don't need my picture, I got plenty, okay? Will your students come up, please? Dr. Kim, would you like to stand in the middle with your student, Ms. Lee?